George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. The British Parliament descends into chaos and farce, all to save the skin of Sir Kid Starver, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader's sordid, tawdry game to disguise his absolute refusal to offend Netanyahu's government in calling for a real ceasefire. They've compromised the Speaker, who will probably now have to resign. I hope he got his full 30 pieces of silver in advance. And Britain fires a nuclear weapon. Well, without the warhead, one hopes, because it went into a loop-de-loop -loop and dropped into the drink like a failed firework. And the massacres in Gaza continue. As we speak, the British Parliament is voting on a motion, or rather not voting on a motion, to call for a ceasefire, like Netanyahu's going to listen to them anyway. It's all coming up here on what will definitely be the mother of all talk shows. Fast. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. One institution after another in once Great Britain has been hollowed out, discredited, and roundly despised. The British court system is on trial this week in the Strand, in the High Court of Justice, where over two days an appeal hearing for the world's most prominent and important political prisoner has been unfolding. The judges have not yet opined, but if they opine the wrong way, then Julian Assange, the world's great publisher, journalist, truth teller, will be on an aeroplane to the United States quicker than you can say Jack Robinson. And then you'll never see him again. You'll never hear from him again. He'll be placed before a hanging judge and jury in CIAville, otherwise known as the state of Virginia, and sent probably for the rest of his life to a supermax penitentiary. And his wife and children will kiss him no more, except very rarely through a glass screen darkly. The whole process has been a farce up to now. The question is, Will the judges who presided over that farce now seek to rec rescue something from the ashes of Britain's reputation by finding in favour of Julian Assange, allowing him to appeal against the frankly ridiculous decision to send him to the United States on a one-sided extradition agreement by deliberately ignoring what the extradition treaty is supposed to be. I know something about this. When it was before the House of Commons, under then Home Secretary David Blunkett, a blind man, he said that on the face of the bill, it was patent that no political prisoner, no prisoner wanted for political offences, could be extradited under this new extradition treaty. He said it to me, face to face, man to man, because I had read, raised concerns about it, as had some others. He told us it could not happen, but now it is happening, or at least unless the judges in the Strand this week decide to call a halt to a damaging farce, which has cost the taxpayer hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to keep incarcerated a gentle journalist whose work was published by all the great newspapers of the world, many of whom then turned their back for many years on Julian, but have at least now all rallied to the call to halt the extradition. If Julian Assange is guilty 
of any crime, then every one of those newspapers who published his work are equally guilty of that offence. But offence there is none. Julian is being extradited on charges of espionage. But he was never in the United States. He's not a citizen of the United States. He owes no duty of any kind to the United States. He has no loyalty of any kind. Neither can he be expected to have any loyalty of any kind to the United States of America, whose war crimes he exposed to the world. And as I said on Sunday, if the criminals can make it a crime for a journalist to report on the actions of the criminals, then you are living in a criminal's state. And that maybe is where we are. The House of Commons is not what it was when I spent the best part of 30 years there. I'm happy, hoping to go back there just over a week from now. And heaven knows they need me. They need some strong hand on the tiller. Because anyone watching live on television right now at the farce, the chaos in the British Parliament knows that it has badly lost its way. I'm not going to bore you with the arcania of parliamentary procedure, but let me try to shorthand it. I never, in all of my time in Parliament, over the 1980s, 90s, noughties, and into the teens, I have never, ever seen the Speaker of the House of Commons choose two amendments on an opposition day when the opposition day belonged to the Scottish National Party. The precedent of the House of Commons and the whole thing is governed on precedent, on Erskine May and the precedent of centuries. The opposition party, whose opposition day it is, gets to put a motion and the government gets to put an amendment to it. In this case, the former Labour MP, Lindsay Hoyle, now the Speaker of the House of Commons and nominally independent, was nobbled. In fact, his knees were kneecapped, his ankles were shot through, his arms were tied behind his back to allow not one but two amendments to the SNP motion. Something absolutely without precedent. As the chairwoman of the Precedent Committee, Procedure Committee, just told the House of Commons moments ago, there is no precedent in the entire history of the British Parliament for what the Speaker has just allowed. And he did it on the strength of the blackmail of the Labour opposition. So we've got a Speaker of the House of Commons who could be blackmailed by the opposition. What will happen? God forbid, should they ever be in government. And he's now retreated. He's run away. He's hiding in the building. Hundreds of members of Parliament are walking out noisily. The whole thing has collapsed when millions of people in the country were waiting to see who was for a ceasefire in the slaughter in Gaza and who was not. Why did he do it? Because of the pressure I and people like me up and down the country, the great demonstrations, the great protests, the independent candidates, candidates in by-elections, like me, the pressure we've been putting on the leader of the Labour Party has become simply unbearable to him. He, if this manoeuvre, sordid manoeuvre, had not been executed this evening, would have been facing a rebellion of scores, maybe well over a hundred of his own members of Parliament, who simply cannot return to their constituents without having voted for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Many of them are feeling the pressure. Many of them have small majorities that they're very certain they're going to lose their seats at the next general election. Others are afraid to face the public at all. They run away, like the deputy leader of the Labour Party. Angela Rayner, now renamed Angela Runner, when she sees any of her constituents, she literally breaks into a run for the nearest car so that she can get out of town because so many thousands 
of her constituents are disgusted by the Labour Party's support for Netanyahu's genocide in Gaza. So these Labour MPs wanted a third way, Tony Blair might call it, a third way that allowed them to pretend that they supported a ceasefire, but with a form of words which guaranteed no ceasefire at all. The form of words that they preferred made no mention of the collective punishment of the Palestinian people in Gaza, even though the International Court of Justice has already decreed that there is collective punishment bordering, if not over the border, in genocide in its hearing in The Hague just a few weeks ago. The SNP motion demanded an immediate ceasefire. The Labour amendment, which should never even be on the table, called for a humanitarian ceasefire, but only one agreed by Israel, not imposed by outside organizations, courts, UN, anything like that. No, one which Netanyahu could underwrite. And if you look, I could shorthand it even more. If you want to know the quality of the Labour amendment that should never have been, just look at who is proposing it. Not just Keir Starmer, not just Angela Rayner, but the Labour fiends of Israel, not friends, the Labour fiends of Israel are all there in their glory, their names written on the order paper, dripping in blood. If they can support the motion, you can be sure that it has been agreed between the Labour fiends of Israel and the Israeli embassy in London that funds them. If that's not true, they can publish who funds them. The fact that they will not publish who funds them makes it clear that it is a front for the state of Israel under Benjamin Netanyahu. Imagine Labour members of parliament funded by the embassy of Benjamin Netanyahu. If it was for a ceasefire, they would not be signing it. It's a wording that has been agreed with the worst scoundrels and criminals in the international community at this time. Any motion acceptable to Benjamin Netanyahu sure ain't acceptable to me and I suspect many millions of others in this country and many millions of others overseas. The Far from the chaos in the House of Commons, of course, a much greater chaos, a bloody chaos, exists in Gaza. You can see from these pictures the sea of starving, sick, and increasingly wounded and maimed humanity that is the Gaza Strip. The imminent invasion of Rafah, a tent city of 1.9 million people, by a Western armed, armed force, a superpower, a military superpower, a nuclear armed superpower, are about to invade a tent city of 1.9 million people. It's normally 125,000. It's now 1.9 because the Palestinians have been cascaded from one end of the Gaza Strip to the other, told, go there, go there, go there. No move from there that we just sent you. You'll be safe if you go there. Oh no, we're about to bomb you there. And finally, almost two millions of them have appeared in the very farthest corner of the Gaza Strip. Just a thin razor wire separating them from the Sinai Desert. A Sinai Desert which belongs to Egypt, which has declared that any attempt to transfer the Palestinian problem from uh, Palestine into Egypt will not be accepted by them. And a state of war will exist between Egypt and Israel if this attempt is made. The bombing continues day and night. 70% of the people who are cut down by that bombing are women and children. These are not my figures. These are the figures of the United Nations. Now some 112,000 people are either dead, wounded, with no possibility of hospital treatment, or missing under the rubble. And of course, 
therefore dead. 112,000 people out of a population of 2.3 million. Well over 5% of the Palestinians in Gaza are dead, wounded, mutilated, or missing under the rubble. Just for an exercise, do 5% of your own country's population, and then you'll see the scale this devastation represents. 10% of the population of Britain is more than 3 million dead, wounded, or missing under the rubble. Do the maths for your own country. This is a very considerable injury, an unprecedented injury, one that has really never been seen before in modern times. The operative word being seen. There have been other massacres. There have been other genocides. But we weren't able to watch them happening as they're happening on our personal telephones. Our children were not able to see them actually happening. So these are unprecedented numbers. This is an unprecedented crime. It represents an unprecedented injury. But the insult that is added to this injury is that throughout the Western world, the establishment political parties and the establishment mass media have covered for this crime, have justified this crime, have censored the pictures of this crime, have throttled the voices standing out against this crime, have criminalized, marginalized, almost literally vaporized any opposition in Western countries. There are countries like Germany where it is now illegal, a criminal offense, to speak as I am doing to you right now. The door could get kicked in. The police could take me away in handcuffs for committing a crime, for telling the truth, just like has happened to poor Julian Assange in Belmarsh. That's the insult that's been added to injury. Truth has been stood on its head. The victims have been painted as the aggressors. The aggressors have been painted as the victims. The Palestinians are called terrorists, while those inflicting terrorism upon them in real time on your telephone are called the victims of terrorism. This insult, this injury, will never be forgotten. The bodies and the blood of the dead and wounded in Gaza will stain the clothes, the hands, and hang around the necks like a giant albatross of all the political parties in the Western world who have made all of this possible, who send the guns, who send the money, who send the diplomatic cover at the United Nations, who extend the unlimited recognition to the criminal state of Israel, who welcome it with a red carpet, who send their delegations uh, endlessly there to serve the purposes of Israeli propaganda. These parties will never be forgiven. Which brings me back to what's happening in the British Parliament right now. They know it. They know that we know it. And they know that we're going to act upon it. They know that I stand on the brink of an historic by-election victory which will shake the walls of Westminster. A victory uh, which will change history. Not just because of its importance in itself, a referendum on Gaza which will have a resounding result, but because it will act with the power of example to encourage people like me to stand up against the so-called mainstream political parties who are now roundly hated by millions, maybe tens of millions of people in this country. And everything that I have said about British politics applies because everything's bigger in America, applies in the United States equally. We have there too a situation where Zion Don and Genocide Joe are vying with each other as to who can be meaner to the Palestinians, who will kill more of them, who will facilitate the killing of more of them. The fact that one is berserk and the other 
is suffering from acute dementia uh, is a very real problem when you're claiming to be the leader of the world. And if I have contempt for the American political class, imagine what I feel for the European political class that have decided to go over the cliff with genocide Joe Biden. Just think about that. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows with great guests, great calls, a great poll, and we want to hear from you. Fasten your seatbelts. It's live from Rochdale. Get used to it. A new dawn has broken, has it not? And that Clinton thing, his eyes were round and big and smiling, and he was very charming. He became this incredible pop idol kind of prime minister. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. New Labour was backed by the most powerful media interests because they realised he was representing them. He was caught red-handed trading policy in return for hard cash from a businessman. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. Both of Bush as well as Tony Blair are now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust. JP Morgan paid him off for the Iraq war. The man is a war criminal. Is Tony Blair a war criminal? In my opinion, yes. Most definitely. The pursuit of money has become the dominant theme in your life. All these relationships are, in most people's estimation, corrupt relationships. No previous Labour Prime Minister has behaved in this shameful, money-grubbing way. How do you sleep at night? You know, it's that. It's as a person. Well, almost 21,000 people have voted on our poll so far, and I haven't even read it out yet. Should Julian Assange be A, extradited, B, freed? You can vote on my telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, my X, on the YouTube community poll or on the YouTube stream. If you're watching on the YouTube stream, please share now with all of your friends, all of your followers. Ditto if you're watching on Facebook or on any other platform that allows you so to do. That's the way we beat Mr. Algorithm. The audience is going up and up and up for the mother of all talk shows for very good reason, that you won't find this level of discourse anywhere else. Phone numbers, if you want to comment, if you're in the US or Canada, it's toll free. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, equally free of charge, 0808196552. If you're in the rest of the world, 442039662625. Our first guest is a very special young man, both because of his ability and courage, and also because he's the son of Palestine's Nelson Mandela, the great leader, Marwan al Barghouti, imprisoned in Israel, but one day destined to be the president of a free Palestine. I I'm perfectly sure. His son's name is Arab Barghouti, and we welcome him back onto the Mother of All talk shows. Uh, Arab, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, the United Nations, again, sunk to the occasion. Uh, the ceasefire motion tabled by Algeria was uh, uh, passed with only one vote against. Uh, but that one vote was the vote of the United States, which promptly issued its veto. Uh, what kind of hope do Palestinians, do Arabs, what kind of hope should humans have in these international organizations? If the United States can be opposed by every other country and yet wreck an attempt to bring about a ceasefire. First of all, thank you so much for having me again, George. I think if if we talk about hope and uh, 
uh, talk about what's happening in the UN and the voting and all of that. I think that it's very hard to find hope in the UN in the Security Council anymore. I think that the Americans and the American government is is insisting on uh, getting naked in front of the whole world like the other Western governments to show their true values, not the values that they promote, their true values that we saw in Iraq, that we saw in Libya, that we saw in Syria. And now we're seeing uh, in, in Palestine, it's not uh, uh, different than any of those. And they insist on uh, uh, killing any hope for only a ceasefire. We're not asking for a lot. We're asking for stopping the war. And I think this is a, a clear uh, um, vision of what Western governments are, are working towards. But to go back to the hope uh, uh, side, uh, part of it, I think that we do have hope. And we do have hope because the world is waking up. It's amazing to see uh, young people all over the world uh, educating themselves about Palestine, about the history of this cause, about why Palestinians are resisting in the first place. Um, many of, of the mainstream media and the Western governments want you to think that the Palestinians are just violent by nature, which is not true. Uh, uh, resistance exists because there is an illegal occupation of our land uh, um, that is by international law, by the UN, not only by Palestinians. So uh, it's it's amazing to see the young people all over the world because these young people will become the leaders of the future, the politicians of the future. And I have so much hope that it's a start of a big movement that things in Palestine will uh, uh, move to the better. And I think someone like you who has a great history of uh, uh, participating in the uh, apartheid regime in South Africa can see that there is a glimpse of, of hope and things are changing. And yes, they take time. But I want to send my regards to all these uh, youth movements, uh, uh, especially my friends in Jewish Voice for Peace and many other Jewish uh, uh, groups that are speaking up against what's, what's happening. Uh, because I think it's, it's very uh, uh, no, normal for them to think that things are not moving, things are just stuck. But things like this will take time and we will have to wait and we will have to keep moving and we can't fail our people in Gaza and just say, yeah, things are not moving and I lost hope. No, we can't afford that. We need to all uh, uh, keep going and keep moving forward until the war stops and uh, until Palestinian children are safe like any other children all over the world. Now, you, uh, your mother and father called you uh, by a great name, Arab. Uh, it's civilization, it's language, uh, the language of the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. Islam came to the Arabs. It stretches from Marrakesh to Bahrain, uh, from the Atlantic uh, to the Gulf. Uh, what you're feeling as an Arab uh, about the failure of most of the Arabs to even raise their voices meaningfully, let alone raising their hands against this terrible crime? Well, I think it's very uh, um, disappointing when you look at the Arab governments. They did, uh, you know, uh, they are bearing witness of, of the genocide that is unfolding in Gaza, and you would expect more from Arab governments. And I'm not going to say Arab governments and just generalize, because some of them have been uh, playing a really uh, a vital and good role towards the Palestinian cause and still playing. But the vast majority of them are not. And I think this shows you uh, um, the amount of control that the Western governments and especially the American government has in the region on these uh, uh, governments. But to go back to the hope, I don't think you'll find hope with governments. You'll find hope with, with people. We have 400 million Arabs uh, in, the, in the region. And I think the vast majority of the 400 million are big supporters of the Palestinian cause and have been moving, uh, protesting, and uh, speaking out about what's happening in Palestine. But unfortunately, we have also uh, um, some uh, government uh, restrictions that uh, does not allow them to to speak up uh, like the, the way they want to. 
But I think that if we uh, work together, if we unite uh, in solidarity with with what's happening in in Gaza, uh, we will find that we we have many things to do together. So yes, the governments are something uh, that uh, is disappointing to us to see that they are literally witnessing what's happening without moving whatsoever. But at the same time, we know that we have brothers and sisters, 400 million brothers and sisters in the Arab world that are feeling with us and can make, can make change, change happen. Now, what's the situation on the ground, Arab? Uh, everyone, of course, is quite rightly fixated upon the slaughter in Gaza. But the slaughter in the West Bank uh, has also uh, picked up uh, we have a situation, I'm going to talk about it later, uh, where a, a Christian uh, pastor from Bethlehem uh, who spoke so memorably at Christmas time, became a world celebrity, uh, was denied uh, an audience with the Archbishop of Canterbury today because he had shared a platform with Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of Her Majesty's Opposition a member of parliament, uh, proving uh, that there was no room at the inn for the pastor from Bethlehem. Uh, the, the situation in the West Bank for Muslims as well as Christians is pretty drastic, isn't it? It is, and I think it's uh, uh, going under the radar. I think that the Israeli government is taking the chance and the advantage that the people, the whole world is, is busy with what's happening, the genocide that is unfolding in Gaza, and taking this chance to uh, uh, collectively punish the Palestinian people all over Palestine. We have many cases of stolen houses, demolished, demolished houses, we have thousands of uh, uh, prisoners that got imprisoned from the West Bank since October the 7th. We have so much uh, uh, settler terrorism, what I call settler terrorism, but unfortunately you, you won't find that term in the uh, mainstream media because it's not Muslims that uh, committed uh, those crimes. But just a couple of days ago, the settlers went into Hawara for maybe the third, fourth, fifth time in uh, during a year, in a span of a year, and they uh, uh, burned uh, uh, people's uh, cars, houses, and this is not the first time. Settlers are unleashed in the West Bank. We have more than seven to 800,000 settlers living illegally in the West Bank, and they keep expanding these uh, settlements, what we call the cancer of, of the West Bank. And I think that uh, uh, the, the things that are unfolding in the West Bank are very dangerous and especially that Ramadan is coming, I think that it will be uh, a big problem very soon. But I want to take that chance to also talk about the Palestinian political prisoners because since the last time uh, we, we talked more than two months ago, I think things got really worse in, in prisons because we have now uh, 10 prisoners that uh, got killed in inside Israeli prison. That's the documented cases, of course, since October the 7th, other than the many tens, if not hundreds of, of uh, people who we haven't heard anything about them from Gaza since October the 7th. Um, things are going worse in terms of the conditions, the harsh conditions. Uh, p uh, prisoners are not given uh, enough uh, food, are not given hygiene, are not given clothes. They are put in solitary confinement. They're, they are getting beaten up. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, or actually today, we lost uh, Khaled al-Shawish, who is one of uh, the biggest freedom fighters of Fatah in uh, the second intifada in 2002. And he's been in prison uh, um, since since then, uh, since 2007. And because of uh, health uh, uh, conditions and w w w uh, which he was neglected for years, actually, uh, he he died uh, uh, today. And uh, we have multiple other uh, um, cases that got killed, literally killed by Israeli security guards. And the most the saddest thing about this is that there is no accountability. Like you never hear about a security guard that got uh, punished for killing, literally killing with their own hands, 
بالستينيان بريزنرز لايك ثائر ابو عصب لايك عرفات لايك ماني اذر بريزنرز هو جت كيلد ان ذا لاست فيو مانس اونلي Finally, Arab, uh, what's going to happen in Rafah if the Israeli armed forces invade Rafah? What will be the result? This is a humanitarian disaster that's waiting to happen. And I think that if there was a time uh, to put the biggest pressure uh, on Israel, it would be this time. I think it's very important for everyone to understand that, as I said, it's not enough. Do not get uh, used to uh, uh, the Palestinians uh, getting killed. Do not uh, normalize the Palestinian suffering. I think that we got to a point where some uh, 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 people are normalizing the Palestinian suffering as if it's something that is normal and and uh, there is nothing wrong with that happening because they're going after Hamas and they go all about all these excuses. I think that now is the time for people to go out and protest and uh, uh, speak out and uh, raise their voices against what's happening because we're talking about 1.5 million people in tents in a, a, a place that is so tiny that can barely fit them and uh, uh, any attacks that will happen like a ground invasion we're talking about tens of thousands of of people that we will lose Uh, uh, innocent civilians, children, and they want to know about the famine that is happening in in Gaza and unfolding. But today we are hearing about official cases that have been uh, that have died and passed away because of lack of food, because of hunger. We are in 2024, and everyone is talking about you know uh, the the prosperity, about the future, about the development, and all of that. And we're talking about. Uh, uh, not giving people food to live, this is what we got to. And I think the normalization of this is something that I can't get my my head around. The fact that we are dying of hunger, we are dying, getting slaughtered in our homes, uh, uh, children, innocent people, and no one is is uh, is talking on the on the government's level. So now is the time for the people to say their uh, what what they want to say and to go protest and to see some of the biggest protests like we see like we saw uh, uh, two to three months ago this is the time and we can't get tired and we can't fail our people in gaza i mean wonderful as always arab barguti please give your honorable mother my best wishes thank you for joining us on the mother of all talk shows should julian assange be extradited or freed Well, what do you think? 23,000 of you have voted. Uh, It's a very impressive number. Uh, But don't you want to see it as high as it possibly can be? Vote now on Telegram, on X, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. Quick uh, break uh, from me, and I'll be right back. 60 seconds. Come. Let me... uh, say that you can listen to the audio-only version of Moats on our Moats podcast, and the numbers on that are going through the roof. Just search Moats with George Galloway on Apple, Spotify, Google, or whichever platform you listen to your podcasts on. In recent weeks, it's been the number one political podcast in Benin, Jordan, the Gambia, Qatar, Jamaica, Ghana, Iceland, Malaysia, Singapore, Sweden, and the Philippines. Number one political podcast in all those countries. Truly, truly phenomenal. Do you know that BBC News has lost 40% of its audience in the last two years? It's official. And of course, that is the sensible thing to do. But to get people to tune in and change course, and listen to a radically different point of view. It's even more difficult, but it's happening. And the numbers that we are racking up are now in their millions. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now scan the QR code on your screens to download our podcast 
and to make sure that you get it regularly. It is stunningly effective, this podcast. People who can be looking at a screen, maybe they're driving or whatever, are listening to this podcast all over the world. Number one in some of the most remote parts of the globe uh, that you would never imagine. So uh, we are doing well with this podcast, but we want to lift it into the stratosphere. Thank you. Scan the QR code now. What does that actually mean? I don't know, but I'm told by my clever friends that it means you get a shortcut straight to the podcast. Let's go to the lines. Shaima is in Canada on Palestine. This is the global university of the airwaves, after all. Shaima, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Galloway. Salaam alaikum. Good evening. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, please bear with me. I'm a little bit nervous. This is my first time ever calling a show. So I wrote up something, and okay. I hope you give me a chance to say it. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I am a daughter of a Palestinian nine-year-old boy who was made refugee in 1948. God bless his heart. My father is still alive today. However, his heart is broken about what's going on in Palestine, and especially in Gaza. I feel he's reliving his childhood horror from 75 years ago through the suffering and genocide that is going on. And we are all watching today. Even though he went through a lot as a child, he tells me it's nothing to compare to the violence and carnage that is going on. So many times when he calls me to ask how I'm doing or when I call him to ask how he is doing, we end up silent on the phone line. I know at that moment where his heart and mind is and he is sure the same is happening with me. For the past two days, I haven't slept. I was thinking about Judgment Day, and this morning, I see the title of your show, Judgment Day, but I'm talking about the Judgment Day where we will all face God. We will all face Allah, looking for our, looking at our sins and our deeds. And I wondered about what will we each say that day. I saw myself weeping in front of Allah to forgive my weakness. And I could not bring, that I could not bring water and food to the children of Gaza. And I, and I wondered, a person, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to name a name, but like President Rajabdin Erdogan, he was in Egypt. So short, so close to Rafah. And so many others like him, heads, so-called heads of state, when, we, when they will face Allah, what will they tell him? He gave them wealth. He gave them power. He gave them armies. He gave them weapons. But especially him, he's a NATO ally. What will he say to Allah in front of Gazans that will be staring at his face that day? What will he say? I was... Well, uh, that, that's uh, a particularly powerful, uh, no, uh, it's uh, extremely moving and powerful testimony. Uh, of course, uh, President Erdogan's not here to answer it. Uh, if he were, I'm sure he'd say there are others uh, have done less than me. Uh, and that is undoubtedly true. Uh, but you're right. Uh, they could put a catapult of the kind that we had in the medieval times on the Egyptian side of the border and 24 hours a day they could catapult over that fence the food that people in Gaza are dying for the want of. They will not do it because they are afraid that Israel will make war on them. And that will be a pretty difficult thing to have to confess on the Judgment Day. We're also talking about that Judgment Day in the title of this show. We're talking about Julian Assange's Judgment Day. 
were talking about the judgment in the British Parliament on the treachery of the so-called Labour opposition uh, towards the catastrophe that we are watching. And we are talking about the judgment day that all of us one day will face. And some with more confidence than others. Shaima, give my salam to your uh, great father who made a daughter such as you. Denise is on the line in London on Julian Assange. Let's hear from her. Denise, welcome. Hi, George. Thank you for taking my call. And just uh, an absolute pleasure to speak with you this evening on some of the most serious topics you. that you always talk about so well with all your guests. Um, I just wanted to Thank talk you. about three points, if I could, just quickly. I know you've, you've got a lot of people waiting to speak with you. Um, the first thing is that I was in the court yesterday on the Julian Assange case. I managed to get into court and... Um, and I have to say, it was a, a shocking experience insofar as that it was held in court number five, which is one of the smallest courts within the Royal Court of Justice. This is the most significant courthouse in the land. And yet it was put in a very tiny court with an overflow court next door for all the journalists and interested people that wished to attend. So there was already an atmosphere of restriction that happened straight away. Um, the, the judge at the beginning of the case made a, a point particularly about that Julian Assange um, had been offered the opportunity to attend the court, both in person or by video conference, and that he had declined, obviously, due to health reasons. Um, I'm going to make a point that is absolutely anybody who's ever been in court five. And, and again, I'm speaking from the legal profession here as well. Um, the defendant, if they do attend court, they sit in a dock area, which in court five is wrought iron bars that surround the defendant's dock area. That is so archaic. And I am just so glad that Julian Assange, despite his bad health and ill health, did not attend because that would have been the most dehumanizing experience for him as a non-convicted person to have to sit behind that wrought iron bars and bench the whole day so that was just my my first initial thought about it and glad that he didn't attend for that very reason and for his health um the other thing that i would say is and, I, and i'm talking about the aesthetics of, of the court there was technical issues the whole day yesterday to the point that everybody who sat in court three literally left throughout the day because the technicals broke down they couldn't hear anything and today when I went to court, the same thing happened again. Loads of people walked out. And I think that was purposeful. Um, even, even in the court that I was sitting in where the barristers were given uh, their, their kind of um, their summations and so forth, the acoustics was terrible. So it really lended itself towards a very um, non-inviting environment for the people that attended the court. And I think that was deliberate. Um, the, the second point I'd probably mention is that, and it was significant and raised yesterday by Assange's barrister, was that the, the most important aspect of this case is that there's allegedly 18 charges against Julian Assange of all varieties, from everything from espionage down to what I, we, we, we don't know the full extent of the 18 charges on his legal team do. But the significant point was that they said that Julian, if he extradited to the US, he could also be charged on separate counts which constitute relevant conduct. And relevant conduct means charges that are not part of the existing 18 charges, but could be anything extraneous that could even amount to what could be a capital offence punishment. I mean, that was just a, an absolute shocker to have heard that in the court yesterday and really demonstrates that Julian Assange is being punished for, you know, there's, a, there's an excessive punishment that's going on here. And the, the final point I would just make is the public interest point that his counsel raised throughout the day. And they really focused on, there was a number of areas they focused on, but they focused on public interest. And they, they discussed also the attacks on uh, Julian Assange while he was at the Ecuadorian embassy and the plot to actually have him killed while there at the end embassy. So there was, I, I think, the growth disproportionate punishment that he is suffering now as a man who is innocent. He is sitting in Belmarsh tonight 
and he is absolutely, you know, being subject to treatment that no other extradition person might generally be subject to. And it's a shocking state of affairs. But just as a final point, I should say a huge thank you to everybody who stood at the court yesterday, all day yesterday and all day again in the rain and stood there with their banners and protesting. It was a fantastic sight. And like any protests, these people were absolutely amazing. And my absolute hat off to all of them. Um, And I'm sure the family of Julian Assange, uh, Chris Hedges was there, Craig Murray, Claire Daly, Mick Wallace. It was, a, it was a great sight to see all the people there. So just my huge thanks to everybody who attended, George. Amen, amen. Thank you, Denise, for that wonderful account. We will be talking later in the show uh, to Consortium News uh, Editor-in-Chief, Joe Lauria, uh, to get uh, a second opinion. But you have set that interview up beautifully, Denise. Thank you indeed. Should Julian Assange be extradited or freed you can vote on my telegram channel on my twitter on the youtube community poll and on the youtube stream smart says it doesn't need a question of course Hassan should be freed without a shred of a doubt if not it will be a disaster for democracy a disaster for free journalism a disaster for humanity and jack Klugman, great name says, remember the UK security state, as well as all five eyes and Israel, want him just as bad. And Gerard White says, prediction, they will grant Julian leave to appeal from Belmarsh. Uh, Line one is in Oxfordshire. Amel is on the line about Julian. Go ahead, Amel. Hello, good evening, George. My name is Amel. I used to talk to you back in the days with West TV. I I remember. I remember. Well, it's no more long. I remember your voice. You are there. George, about the situation with Julian Assange, it's a shame. Um, Mm. They breach democracy, but I don't know what of kind of democracy, George, really he damaged or what he done. Up to now, as a clear head thinking, we really ask about the question, what is the crime this man done? And I think, as a long search for the truth, I think Julian Assange's problem began when he done an interview. I don't know if you remember or not a lot of people remember. Um, that interview was, interview was to do with the resistance in the Middle East. Very, very few people remember it. that time he was speaking with to Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah about the Palestinian issue. I don't think that Julian is being captured by Britain in America about the war crime. What they doing? The war crime was open eyes. But as long as you touch the subject about the Palestinian and about that area, even if you are not criminal, they will find your crime. And they don't need no church because there are the churches. Julian Assange, do we owe him some things? Yes, we owe him some things. We will remember him. We will educate our children. We will, he will be a hero. He's already a hero in front of our eyes. Because those who speak the truth... For sure, the Amal, uh, it's a great call, but not a, not a particularly good line. At least for me, I don't know about the audience. A beautiful call. And, of course, he's already a hero. He'll always be a hero. Our grandchildren and their children will, will build statues to Julian Assange. And shame on the British injustice system that has treated him so shamefully. Uh, Reeves, Reevesy says, I presume they lied about him being too ill to attend as they didn't want all the cameras trying to get a photo of him. Keep it low key. Well, you're not allowed to take photos in British uh, courtrooms, so that uh, wouldn't have happened except through the glass of the prison uh, van. Uh, I think Julian is genuinely too ill to attend. We're keeping a man too ill to attend his court hearing when all the world is watching and people have come from all over the world outside because we've made him so ill he cannot actually face it. Piano Man says Julian Assange is such a hero I never thought this would happen to him or anybody who does the proper job of journalism with integrity. Beautifully said. 
uh, on the line from Kingston upon Hull is Joy on Palestine. Go ahead, Joy. Hi, George. I'm just calling from, I'm Joey. I'm calling from Hull. I'll be quick with what I'm saying, but I just want to credit you for all you've done for the Palestinian cause. I mean, I'm quite young, so obviously, thank you. And um, it's hard to get my voice out. And I've got to say, it's free Palestine. Marvellous. Thank you, Joy. Much appreciated. Uh, Mole says this new 7 p.m. UK time is much better. Uh, the, uh, there are 3.7 thousand people in the chat already. Drop a like and share. Thank you, Mole. I'm glad it's passing muster. Uh, it's, uh, it's good for me, at least when I'm not fighting a by-election. Actually, I'd have preferred the later time now to allow me more time to campaign, but the campaign is coming uh, to a close. Uh, Bob Cosmic says, Greetings to George Galloway at Moats TV. Let us remember Malcolm X, who was assassinated in front of his wife and children on this day, 21st February 1965. Brother, we miss you dearly. As a matter of fact, Bob, I didn't realize this was the death anniversary, but I did speak about Brother Malcolm uh, in the rally I did with Loki last Saturday night here in Rochdale, and that's available on YouTube. And I also gave an interview to the BBC this afternoon in which I quoted Malcolm X. And I said to them, if you say the words Malcolm X on the BBC uh, in this report, I'm a Dutchman. We'll see if I am or not. Sammy Caballero says, I'm worried about Moat's future if you win in Rochdale. So your audience is to be put on hold while you return to politics. The UK and the world at large don't need you. We need you doing what you're doing. Who will and would say the things you say on Moats number one? Uh, Sammy, you can rest assured, Moats with me in the chair will continue at least twice a week, uh, whether I'm in Parliament or not. You don't have to worry about that. Samir is in London on Palestine. Go ahead, Samir. Hi, George. How are you? By the grace of God, good. Thank you. What would you like to say? Yeah, I just wanted to address the issue of the practicality of, of this whole Gaza, you know, uh, the, this whole Gaza thing that's happening. You know, like we're seeing the images, okay? You know, people are starving. People are picking up flour mixed in with, with the mud on the floor. Uh, you know, it, it's just really, really heartbreaking. So it's just like, I can't, I don't think I'm the only one thinking of, of practical solutions here. And yes, uh, protesting in the streets is extremely important. You know, uh, calling your local MPs, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, pushing the messages on, on, on the social media, IG awareness, BDS, all those things are very important, George. But Unfortunately, this is going to take time, you know, like this movement of basically discrediting all this propaganda and all, all the Western, you know, influence and, and, and uh, the, the corruption that's so embedded, you know, uh, you, you've essentially got uh, this uh, capit uh, uh, political capitalism at work here, you know, at its best. And it's just it's so pervasive that it's going to take time to, to push these guys uh, to, to move and, and, and uh, you know, in, in terms of like BDS and all these, all this movement and, and to discredit Israel as a state, because I personally think Israel is not a viable state anymore. It's, it's, to me, it's a satanic state and it doesn't belong in the 21st century, in, in the, the year 2024. I'm sorry. That state should not exist. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, these people are dying, George. These people, this is the, the, they're dying daily deaths, hundreds of children dying every day. We have to get these people out of there. We have to get these people out of there. Okay, let's appease to, the, to, the, to these people. Let, let's put them out of there and then continue the fight. Continue to fight to completely. No, I knew you. Just, just I, 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 I knew. No, I knew that you were coming to that point of view. It's called concern trolling. Uh, your punchline is that the Palestinians should leave. 
Well, they've done that before. 800,000 of them left their land and have never been able to return. And foreigners are living in their houses and on their lands. And they have become uh, 12, 13 millions of people uh, scattered to the four corners of the earth. Those who clung to the land in Palestine will never leave it. Uh, they will stand there. They, some of them will fight there. And many of them will die there. But none of them will get them out of there to use your phrase. None of them will, because they know that they would never be able to return, and they would rather die on their feet than live on their knees as refugees in yet another refugee camp in yet another part of the world. So I was already forming the view that yours was a council of despair, and then I realized that it was deliberately designed to be so. Uh, I know that this is going to take time because I've been doing it for more than 50 years. But once upon a time, 50 years ago, I could have fitted all of the supporters of the PLO, like me, into one hall. Now you could not fit all the supporters of the Palestinian cause into all of central London, north and south of the river. Now we are millions. Our thousands became millions. We are all Palestinians. And this is repeated all over the world, including all over the Arab world. And one day, God willing, that will tell. Thank you, not for your call, Samir in London. Let me take a quick break. And I'll be right back with a top guest, Lara Elborno, the American star, international lawyer, and co host of the Palestine Pod. Don't miss her. You don't get to call me far right. You don't get to call me that on my own show. A lifelong socialist the leader of a socialist party, the Workers' Party of Britain, with an Indonesian wife, with five mixed-race children, with a record of fighting racism all of my life, representing more people of color in the British Parliament than anyone in history by a country mile. You don't get to call me far right. These kind of idiotic insults tossed around by infantile leftists who think that anyone to the right of them is a fascist, is a racist. They are the cause of the crashing and burning of what used to be called the left. They are the cause of it. They have discredited leftism with their foolish, idiot isms and is and smears that emanate from them like a bad smell. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. And it's live from Rochdale. Get used to it. Should Julian Assange be extradited? or free, have your say. 24,000 people now have voted. Uh, one of our most popular guests over the last uh, four months or so is Lara Elborno, a Palestinian-American international lawyer, co-host of the Palestine Pod, as well as being a very considerable activist. And I'm glad to say she's back with us now. Lara, thank you uh, for joining us uh, on the Mother of All talk shows. Just before we go uh, deeper. Uh, we had a, a caller just a few moments ago uh, with a council of despair, uh, which ended with, uh, we have to get the people of Gaza out of there. They have to leave uh, the country or they'll all be killed. Uh, this is now becoming uh, what we call concern trolling. This is now becoming an Israeli ploy. 
to uh, make people so desperate in Gaza that they will abandon their country uh, as the people in 1948 did in the original Nakba. Uh, what are the prospects of success of that kind of uh, um, trolling? Well, thank you for having me, George. Um, look, I, you know, I think it's it's difficult to say with 100% certainty. Um, it's certainly likely and possible that many Palestinians, once this genocidal campaign has finally come to an end, um, will find themselves outside of Gaza. Um, many have already um, uh, managed to escape through Egypt just to secure their safety um, and also because their houses have already been destroyed by Israel. Um, but also many Palestinians are insistent that they will never leave, that they would rather die in Gaza with dignity than be expelled to the Sinai or expelled to any other country, um, seeing this very clearly as a continuation of the Nakba, which began over 75 years ago and which is insistent on stealing all of their land um, and expelling them from it. And so I think um, really... Uh, you know, it's it's sort of a, an uncertain or unclear outcome at this stage. I think certainly a lot of it will. Um, and whether Israel um, actually commits to an escalation in Rafah as it has promised, um, if that happens, uh, it's very likely that we will see a mass exodus because people will be slaughtered. And we know at the same time, um, uh, Egypt is now building a fortified buffer zone um, in the Sinai um, that we have seen drone footage of. And so it's very possible that, that Israel will literally, you know, push Palestinians out at gunpoint, essentially, by massacring them to the point of expulsion. I hope that this doesn't happen. Um, I desperately hope that this doesn't happen. And we need urgent action today to ensure that it doesn't happen. But um, uh, I, I, I will say that at the end of the day, only Palestinians the outcome of their lives. And they are entitled, like any people, to the right of self-determination, to make choices about their own life, their own future. And I just ask anybody who thinks that the solution is that Palestinians must leave their land, which one of you is willing to leave your land? You know, it's it's it, people throw this suggestion around um, so easily uh, as if it's just this obvious solution to this problem. Um, but uh, query, which one of you is ready to leave your home? Which one of you is ready to leave your land? And I think the answer to that is that most people are not. But for some reason, they expect Palestinians would never do. Uh, quite. I'm getting some interruption on your line. I hope the audience isn't, but I'll keep talking in the hope that you can hear me. Uh, what's happening in our own countries? In uh, Britain, uh, the House of Commons is in a state of total chaos this evening uh, in order to preserve the government and opposition uh, pro-Israel consensus. They're struggling hard to maintain it, but they will, I think, be able to maintain it. In the United States, I saw Donald Trump online this afternoon saying that he's going to ban all what he called Hamas marches. I presume he means pro-Palestinian marches. He's going to ban uh, pro-Palestinian meetings. He's going to hunt people like you down. Meanwhile, Genocide Joe uh, pretends to be aghast at what Netanyahu is doing, but writes a check for $14 billion more, sends the weapons of mass destruction uh, to Netanyahu's army. Uh, we're in a pretty pickle when there's not even a political choice in our own countries as to whether or not uh, we support this uh, genocide. Yes, absolutely. But I mean, let's be very clear. I, I don't think that, um, uh, you know, Joe Biden cares at all. Um, the U.S. has just issued its third veto in, uh, you know, 137 days of genocide, mm -hmm. insisting that the genocide must continue against the will of 100, you know, over 150 states, which invoked the Uniting for Peace um, um, provision twice against the extraordinary invocation of Article 99 by the U.N. Security General, against also the ICJ ruling on provision 
provisional measures, finding that there was plausible genocide and um, and that that um, Israel has a duty to prevent genocide. So this is very much a, a U.S. and Israeli genocide of Gaza. Whatever words that um, Joe Biden may muster to try to suggest that he may be opposed to it are absolutely um, you know, nonsense. Um, all you have to do is look at the actions. And the actions are that since the very beginning, the U.S. has been insistent that there are, quote, no red lines for Israel. Obviously, international law paints many red lines, but the U.S. has said that Israel has no red lines um, and has allowed Israel to continue now for nearly 140 days um, without interruption, um, expelling Palestinians, killing Palestinians, injuring Palestinians. Over 14,000 children have been killed. 17,000 children have been separated from their parents or are orphaned. Um, this is a grave, grave humanitarian disaster. And um, I simply don't have any sympathy for this notion that anybody in, 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 in the Biden administration actually cares about Palestinian life whatsoever. Um, the choices are obviously, you know, very dark if you're a voter um, in the United States or in the UK. But, um, you know, for Palestinians um, and, and those who are our allies, it's simply not going to work to threaten us again with, uh, you know, how typically these um, elections go in the U.S. is that Democrats can't offer you very much. The only thing they can offer you is that they're not Republicans. And so uh, typically we're scared into voting for them because of the threat of what, what might happen if a Republican is in power. That's not going to work anymore. And I think many voters have expressed that they will not be intimidated into voting for Joe Biden because the opposite could be worse. Because frankly, as a Palestinian right now, nothing has been worse in my entire life than the last 140 days. Now, uh, let me take advantage of your uh, distinguished uh, legal experience and knowledge. Uh, South Africa took another go at the ICJ last Friday. I have not had time to study it in detail, but at a glance it seemed that the ICJ had failed to rise to the occasion uh, of South Africa's latest effort. Can you explain to the viewers what that effort was and how badly, if at all, the ICJ let them down, let us down? Well, I think we should be very careful about the interpretations, uh, you know, of, of legal um, decisions that we see in media because they are spun with this media bias um, that is very pro-Israeli um, uh, to begin with and actually twist the wording of these legal decisions. That's exactly what the U.S. and Israel did with the order for provisional measures. They went around on a media campaign telling everybody that they won, when in reality they completely ignored that the court had ordered no less than six provisional measures that clearly instructed Israel, told Israel to stop the killing to uh, prevent and punish incitement, to ensure that their military did not carry out any genocidal acts, and so on and so forth. But this is not how this was spun in the media. Now, with respect to the follow-up action that was um, uh, brought by South Africa, it was brought as sort of an emergency petition in response to Israel's threats of a, 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 an invasion and escalation of Rafah, where right now more than 1.5 million Palestinians have been concentrated. Um, they have been pushed down further and further south over the course of four months uh, as a result of so-called evacuation orders by Israel, where Israel told them, if you go south, you'll be safe. Well, what Israel did was it expelled them from their homes, destroyed the majority of their homes. Now over 70% of all the infrastructure in Gaza has been destroyed by Israel. Now you have 1.5 million Palestinians that are concentrated in the southernmost part of Gaza in makeshift tents. And Israel is threatening for, for the last you know um, several days now, if not weeks, to invade Rafah in a very, very, very serious way, a ground invasion, an escalation. And of course, the world has completely rejected this and come out in serious opposition to this. Um, and this is an indication that Israel is clearly not abiding by uh, the order for provisional measures, which was rendered by the court. And so what South Africa did was it went before the court and it said that due to these exceptional circumstances of this threat uh, of an Israeli invasion and escalation in Rafah, we are seeking additional measures to ensure um, the protection of the Palestinian uh, population. 
Um, and basically what the court did was that it decided not to issue any new provisional measures, but it still nevertheless referred to the situation in Gaza and in particular in Rafah as a, quote, humanitarian nightmare, um, insisting um, that it, this was a, quote, perilous situation, which demanded um, immediate and effective implementation of the provisional measures indicated by the court in its order of January 26. So basically what the court was saying was if Israel actually were to abide by the six provisional measures that we ordered in January, then it wouldn't be allowed to carry out this invasion and escalation of Rafah. And so we don't need to add any new provisional measures because the only thing that's missing here is Israel's compliance with the original ones that we um, actually ordered. And so I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding, perhaps, in terms of what is the role of the court and then what is the role of the rest of the world. The role of the court is to decide the law um, and order the measures that it did. But the, the the role of enforcement, actually getting Israel to comply with the order of the court, is not the court's responsibility. That's, that's the responsibility of the people. That's the responsibility of states. That's the responsibility of companies who have the ability to stop doing business with Israeli companies, states who have the who have the uh, power to sanction Israel, uh, to cut ties with Israel. And while we have seen some of that, we certainly have not seen enough in order to actually compel Israel to change its behavior. So I think it's worth um, just recalling, you know, we've seen for example, a Japanese firm cut ties with an Israeli defense firm. We've seen Belgium suspend um, some arms uh, export licenses to Israel. We've seen a Dutch court just a few days ago um, suspend the transfer of F-35 fighter jet parts to Israel. This is the type of stuff that we need to see much, much more of. And 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 to be frank, we need to see really just a mass movement of of action to isolate um, uh, Israel in order to counter this unconditional support that, that, that the U.S. provides it. And I'm going to quote just from um, the uh, oral argument of the lawyer uh, Philippe Sands, who, who argued on behalf of um, Palestine in the ICJ hearing that's pending this week um, on, on the legality of the occupation. And he said that the right of self-determination requires that the U.N. member states bring Israel's occupation to an immediate end and he said, no aid, no assistance, no complicity, no contribution to forcible actions, no money, no arms, no trade, no nothing. That's the kind of stuff that we need to see in order to compel Israel to comply with its international obligations, including the ICJ's order on provisional measures in the genocide case brought by South Africa. Finally, uh, the 26th uh, hearing gave them one month uh, to report back on uh, on what they had done in relation to the findings of the ICJ. Is there any sign that they are doing that, intend to do that? It will soon be the 26th of February. They're going to show up, and if they are, what are they going to say? I think it's possible. I think it's likely that they will show up. I think that they're going to submit a report that um, completely obfuscates the factual reality on the ground. They're going to say that it, since the court's uh, order, they have continued to comply with international law, which Israel holds um, you know, to be very dear. They always say in word and in deed. Um, that's kind of their slogan right now. Um, they're going to say that the only actions that they have carried out have targeted Hamas and that the civilians that were killed were collateral damage. But that's just simply not consistent with the reality on the ground, because even since the ICJ order on provisional measures, we have continued to see statements of genocidal intent being made at the highest levels of Israeli government. Um, and total contempt for the International Court of Justice also being made by government officials. And so therefore, because the genocidal intent continues to be demonstrated and the actions that follow are uh, reflective of that intent, um, I, I don't think that that's going to be a very convincing argument. Um, but we will see what the court um, will des decide to do uh, with that update. South Africa will have the opportunity to respond. But ultimately, I think... I just want to emphasize this is really a question of how do we compel Israel to actually abide by its obligations? How do we, you know, take this order 
um, and enforce it. Um, and, and that's really the job of the people, the governments, and we need to be doing much more to uh, cut off Israel, to isolate it, and, and to treat it as the pariah that it is. Amen. Thank you, Lara Elbono. We'll keep that under review. Hope we uh, can have you back soon uh, to discuss that. Let me take a quick break, and then it's the one and only Joe Lauria, one of my favorite journalists in the world. He's coming up right after this break. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily posting discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza, uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So it was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. uh, 25,000 people have now voted. Get your vote in in the next 20 minutes. Uh, Bram says, I've met Joe Lauria. He's a great journalist and humanitarian. We need more like him. Indeed, we do. But let's take a call before we see him. It's Mohammed in Florida reacting to Samir's call. Go ahead, Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, George. I heard that you were able to say it. Wa alaikum so, salam. And uh, I think I'm only going to start by adding on to a lot of great points that she emphasized on, which begin with people needing to recognize that Israel is the threat and it's no longer quote-unquote conspiracy or, you know, ultra left-wing Hollywood stage acting. It's uh, the truth. Um, And people need to realize that their voice also does have an impact, which further adds on to her point of sanctioning from all perspectives, literally. Uh, I think (laughs) the shit show has to come to an end, and Palestinians, Palestinians, من حول العالم من كل العالم من كل الأطراف زهانة and we're all burning up from inside while Gaza is burning up from the ground up and people can have an influence with every word and every moment and I hope whoever does have the ultimate control within those control war rooms realizes that at the end of the day, we cannot continue counting off Palestinians as that, as, um, hey, we got one target. Oops, there goes three families as well. It's madness. And it's madness indeed, be- Mohammed. Uh, not a great call. Uh, you sound as if you're in the bath or underwater. You don't take baths in America, do you? Um, Now, Mohammed in Florida uh, was the last call that I've got on my uh, stream because we've literally jammed our switchboard. Uh, So if you're trying to get through, I'm very sorry, but it is another record number of phone calls coming into the show. I'm sure that more will come, but it gives me the chance to go 
slightly earlier than I had intended to Joe Lauria, who is not just the editor-in-chief of Consortium News, he is an author, he's the correspondent, and he is a co-host of CN Live, which is indispensable for international news. I'm glad to say he joins us now. Joe, thanks uh, very much indeed. It's been a while since I was able to interview you, but you're in Blighty. You're in London for the uh, Julian Assange hearings. Give us, please, some of the flavor of that. Hello, George. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just a few blocks from the Royal Courts of Justice in a hotel here. Um, it was a bizarre two days, kind of delusory world of the uh, uh, the United States and the construction of a, of a kind of fake world that we see imposed on the world. And too many people go along with it. And we saw that in the courtroom where they describe investigative journalism, standard practices of journalism, happening every day as espionage and as uh, a unique threat to national security. And how this journalist, John uh, Julian Assange, was actually not a journalist, but he was endangering uh, informants' lives. And on and on and on, just exactly what's in that indictment. And um, the problem is that um, this was his last gasp. Back in 2020, there was an extradition treaty. Of course, Julian was arrested on 2019. In April, in charge with espionage for publishing secrets, government secrets, not only of the United States, but many governments around the world, exposing crimes. And he was arrested for that. One of his lawyers made it very clear that there is a nexus between the publication of those documents and his persecution, that there was a timeline that shows the motives of the United States. That it was really quite interesting how he laid this out. For six years, there was no prosecution of Julian Assange. These documents that he was he's been charged with were published in 2010. They were also published by Le Monde, Der Spiegel, El Pais, The Guardian, and The New York Times. At that time, Joe Biden, who was vice president, was asked on Meet the Press, a U.S. talk show, uh, whether they were going to uh, go after Julian Assange. He said, we can't prosecute him if we can't prove that we got him red-handed stealing these government documents. If he passively received them as a journalist, there's nothing we could do. Well, the Obama administration didn't in indict him because they couldn't catch him red-handed. And uh, even though they don't call him a journalist, they knew that he was acting as one. But six years later, something happened. The International Criminal Court decided to, this is according to Julian Assange's lawyer, Mark Summers, the ICC decided to look into Afghanistan and maybe, uh, maybe actually even prosecute the United States for war crimes in Afghanistan, and partly based on WikiLeaks releases. Suddenly there were attacks, American officials started attacking Julian Assange, and then when the 2017 Vault 7 leaks came out, which exposing CIA spying tools, Mike Pompeo in his first public appearance, a CIA director, went after him very strongly and called him in a non-hostile, uh, non-state intelligence service, which was a legal term which allowed the CIA to then use any operative they, operations they wanted without oversight from Congress. And as we know, they actually had plans that mm -hmm. Donald Trump asked for and Mike Pompeo drew up to either kill or or rendition Julian Assange. Uh, and then they didn't know where to put him. So the White House lawyers thought this was going too far. You better come up with an indictment. That's the reason he was indicted, George. And he then went on uh, extradition hearing in 2020. He was he won. The judge, Vanessa Beretta, the magistrate judge, said that his me mental health conditions, his suicidal tendencies and the condition of U.S. prisons meant he should not be extradited to the U.S. The U.S. then appealed that to the high court with some after-the-fact assurances saying, we, we'll treat him well, he won't be, uh, he'll won't be. he get medical care and won't go into a, into a dungeon. And, and the high court accepted that. They didn't challenge the diagnosis, his health diagnosis, they just said the U.S., uh, they believed the U.S., that they would take care of him. When Assange wanted them to appeal that to the U.K. Supreme Court, the court, Supreme Court did not take the case. Now they're trying to appeal one last time at the high court, and a high court judge rejected last June their appeal on many, many points of law. Uh, and what we saw today, yesterday and today, Tuesday and Wednesday this week, George, was uh, an appeal about an appeal. The Assange lawyers now are trying to get two new high court judges to agree to have an appeal uh, to actually what we saw was a dry run these two days, a kind of mini 
um, appeal. So we went over all the issues. And I think these two judges were quite surprised at things that they heard. Uh, I don't think they were very well, well, well versed in the Assange case. They did stick, unfortunately, to some of these um, myths, really, that uh, part of this grand deception that Assange was in an hurting informants, that he didn't redact the names from the documents. That they kept asking about, but they also had some intelligent questions, which makes me believe that they're going to give the appeal. But it won't happen, I believe, until after November. We won't get a decision about what happened these two days until after the election, because the last thing Joe Biden needs is a journalist in chain showing up on the American shores during a presidential campaign where Donald Trump would certainly make something out of that. Because a lot of he's the one who's responsible for Assange's indictments. I'm not talking of anything uh, good about him in terms of Assange, but his supporters, many of them are libertarians, they care not only about the second, but also the first amendment. So he would make something out of that. I don't think we're going to get anything till November. And I do think that I believe from what I saw that there would be, and I was inside the courtroom sitting between the, the bench and the lawyers behind me. I think that uh, in a very small courtroom, courtroom five, that they're going to allow this appeal. Now, uh, Joe, one of the things that strikes me as you adumbrate the, the chronology of all of this is how grossly disproportionate it all is. I mean, what a waste of time and money and a man's life over stories. Yesterday's fish and chip paper from 2010, <laughs> almost 15 years ago. A 15-year epic saga uh, over a set of stories that are now accepted everywhere as fact. Everybody knows about American crimes uh, in Abu Ghraib, in the war logs, in the conduct of the occupation of Afghanistan, and so on. Everybody kind of knows that and has banked that or discounted that, and yet the U.S. juggernaut keeps on coming for Julian. Why do you think? They can't let anybody else do what he's done. Uh, this was something they never expected. That uh, A new form of journalism, almost analogous to Gutenberg and the printing press, using the Internet to put out raw documents, hanging the U.S. by their own words and other governments. And this is something they can't allow to happen again. And they're making, obviously, an example of him, and they want vengeance. And when I say they, I mean basically the Central Intelligence Agency, who we know was actually considered seriously killing him, poisoning him, uh, or, or kidnapping him and renditioning back to the U.S. from the embassy of Ecuador here in London, where he lived for seven years. So uh, they, they have to get him. They're just mad. They're mad. Uh, they want revenge. They cannot be treated like this by someone with a, with a computer and it was able to to expose their dirty secrets. This is really it. This is any, and, and one of, uh, Mark Summers, again, one of Assange's lawyers, pointed out in his presentation and his submissions that uh, the U.S. is acting like any authoritarian regime would treat any dissident journalist who exposed their secret crimes, and that the U.S. side never wants to talk about what's in the documents, and he making this clear. This has to be talked about. And there's a lot of issues. You know, the death penalty is still not off the table here. This became a big issue over the last two days because uh, under the Espionage Act, in a time of war, they could put a death penalty there. Now, it, that's highly unlikely, it seems. However, the U.S. refuses to give assurances. I should say the Home Secretary refuses to ask the U.S. for assurances, which in extradition cases to countries where there is the death penalty is a routine matter for a British Home Secretary because under the law and under the extradition treaty the U.S. has uh, with Britain and what Britain has with other countries, if the country, if if the person sought is going to could get the death penalty, Britain doesn't send that person. Why won't they ask the U.S. to give an assurance? So this is chilling. Again, probably won't happen. The First Amendment, he's going to be denied the right of the First Amendment, which is a violation under Article 10 of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, the equivalent of the U.S. First Amendment. Uh, there are many, many of these points of law that we discussed, uh, that were discussed in the court that Assange is, um, you know, he's, he's even if he, uh, George, even if he gets this uh, hearing, he's going to stay in Belmarsh prison, having already served his, his uh, bail jumping charge. He's been four years since then without any conviction, and they're going to keep him there at least another year or more probably 
uh, because of this high his this this appeal that he wants to have. So maybe they are already getting the punishment that they've sought. They can't let this guy get away with it. They want to make a huge example of him. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. You'd think, though, Joe, that they've, they've really had their pound of flesh. I mean, how much do you want? The guy's done, effectively done 15 years uh, of incarceration uh, for writing journalism. It's, as I said at the beginning, it's grossly disproportionate, isn't it? Yes, and I think more and more of the world is uh, waking up to that. We've seen many press freedom and human and human rights groups now including Amnesty, we're not st stepping up for him. We have presidents, four or five presidents of Latin American countries asking for, a bond, for Joe Biden to drop this charge. We have the Australian parliament passing a resolution about 10 days ago demanding that the U.S. drop this case. You know, Biden will often say, uh, and it was repeated by Albanese, the Australian prime minister, that you know the U.S. can't, uh, the White House can't interfere with the Justice Department because there's a Chinese wall there. It's political and has to stay out of the you know, meeting. Meeting justice cannot be. And yet we saw George. We saw this story where the uh, the prosecutor who interviewed Biden to see whether he would charge him for having classified documents at home exactly. instead put out yeah he said no he the guy can't even remember when he was vice president so we're not going to be able to charge him well you know that the white house lawyers were so furious before that came out they kept sending letters to the department of justice saying do not put that out so of course they'll interfere in the doj when it's in their own interest and not for julian assange for joe laria as always a master at work thank you very much indeed Joe Laria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News, a must-read if you're interested in international affairs. Dot Tester says, Dear Joe, thank you for all you do. You're absolutely right. Love from Yorkshire in England. By the way, just happening, 33 Tory and SNP MPs have signed a motion of no confidence in the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle. Now, uh, coming up, it's live to Gayatri for the social media roundup coming up soon. But comment first, uh, Zilla Burns said, why should Palestinians leave their land? It is their land, home. And Manuel Persinger says, not all Americans are for what our government is doing around the world, especially in Gaza. Our politicians don't hear our voice, the people they serve. And more says, dear British and Americans, how can we stay in our countries that support this each time they tax us or you buy something? That VAT is going directly to more weapons. Couple of calls. Lark is in Toronto on Canada and genocide. Let's hear her. Lark, welcome. Oh, good day and thank you, George. And thank you for your life's work. Welcome and also for reassuring us that you're not going to abandon us once you are elected. No way, and, no way, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I'm calling as a concerned, ashamed, and broken-hearted Canadian. And the, I'm also calling to request that you add Canada to the list of warmongers you mentioned because my country yep. is complicit sorry, so, sorry, in yeah. Ukraine. my country is complicit in Ukraine and Palestine. So yep. please add please add Canada to your list. I'm afraid I don't like to, but I must. I absolutely must. The five eyes are all guilty eyes. Lark, thanks for the call. Mimi is in Washington on genocide. Let's hear her. Mimi, welcome. Hello, George. It's so nice to finally talk to you. Say hi. Um, and you? Uh, and I you, welcome. you on Twitter, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I've been listening to you for like eight years. I just love you, and God bless you and your wife and Gayatri, and the, the kids are beautiful, Thank yeah. Um, yeah, I really, Thank it's you. so, I'm so frustrated. I can't even like, reply to stuff and I you know I follow a lot of Palestinians you know like Motaz and you know thank God he got out but you know I'm not sure what's going on with this whole you know thing it's like 
we all talk about it, and your guests are wonderful. Lara was incredible, and, you know, I think Muhammad was wonderful, either before yeah. or after her. I don't remember the call, yeah. But, I mean, these brilliant minds, you know, much more brilliant than me, obviously. You know, I'm a nurse. You know, I just do my best to, you know, take care of people. I've been a nurse for, like, 40 years, and it's just, you know, I'm especially sure. I've been a pediatric nurse. Yeah, it's just it's nauseating and it, it's it, you know and i've seen birth you know i've helped deliver babies and unfortunately had to assist in uh, you know children not coming out you know through death you know through hospice and i am disgusted i am beyond disgusted and and i don't i mean it's just never going to end up in the united states and you know my family's from italy my grandparents all of them are from italy my you know, they came over here, you know, the legal way, blah, blah, blah. And I would, you know, this country here is in just horrible turmoil, you know, open borders. I mean, just pure evil. You know, it's, you know, obviously pray, 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 but uh, in your honest opinion, I just wanted to know, like, yeah. I don't even know. I just feel well, like... It's evil. I, 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 well, evil is everywhere, Mimi. It's, it's nothing, doesn't have a nationality. It's not Canadian or American or British. Evil is present everywhere. The devil is at work. The problem is, in some countries, the devil is winning. And I'm afraid your country and mine are two of those. We're on a, a roll, I think, of three women in a row. Brianne in Canada on Palestine. Go on, Brianne. Uh, hi, George. It's an honor to be speaking with you live. Hi. It's my first time. Um, I'm also another Thank caller you. from Toronto, and I'm very ashamed of what my country has been doing in aiding and abetting this genocide. Um, I'm a young, young uh, sorry, I'm a mom to two young kids, two, a two-year-old daughter, a five-and-a-half-year-old son, and I, I'm just horrified by the endless carnage that images that I see coming out of Gaza and um, I'm just looking for a glimmer of hope and I'm seeking your expert opinion on um, your expert opinion on how this might end when it will end um, and and so on and so forth well I wish I could give you uh, an expert opinion uh, but I don't think anybody can uh, all we can do is what we can do. We can't be certain of what the impact of our actions uh, will be, uh, but we must do as a matter of conscience, or if you're a religious person, a matter of religious obligation, uh, we must do everything that we can do and pray to God that it will be enough to change things. And there's good reason uh, to still have hope and to keep going. Uh, even if there was no hope, I'd keep going because I'd at least be able to answer on the judgment day for what I myself did. But there is hope. The hope is in our numbers. We have to boycott. We're already boycotting all kinds of products and it's working. They're all reporting. Drops in sales significant drops in profit, uh, grave concern, and all of that. We need to boycott. We need to protest, often, in numbers and with imagination. We need to vote, as the people here in Rochdale will do uh, just over a week from now, when we get the opportunity to vote out the parties that are supporting the genocide. We must take them. And if that opportunity isn't yet available in your area, you need to make it. You need to join with people intelligently, shrewdly, in a way that will punish the incumbent uh, genocide enabler. Uh, we need to link up with Palestinian organizations. It's difficult now in Gaza, but in the West Bank, you can link up your church with another church your trade union with another trade union, your community organization, your nursery, whatever, with another in Palestine, you need to reach out to them so that they know that people in Canada and in Britain and everywhere in the world are thinking about them because that is important for their morale. We're entitled to feel uh, 
a kind of gut-wrenching sadness at what is going. We're entitled for our hearts to be broken, but we're not entitled to allow our spirits to be broken because the people there are depending on our spirits and our determination to go on. I've been doing it for more than 50 years. You're a much younger person than me. And God bless your two young children. But we have to dig in for the long haul. We will never give up. No matter what the cost, we will never give up until we prevail and Palestine can be free. Brian, thank you uh, for that. Uh, coming up in a minute, the Professor Simon in Florida is next up. But first, it's my good wife, Gayatri, with the social media roundup. What's rattling, Gayatri? There's rattling a lot about Julian Assange. Obviously, everyone is watching um, the news to get the latest updates uh, and hope for the best, pray for the best, um, because we all feel so compelled by his case, by the injustice um, of his case. Uh, here is Robin Hansman, uh, your patron. Isn't the US a bit like the Roman Empire, but with state-of-the-art weapons and propaganda? A very dangerous mix indeed. And Mr. Mark Smith says, this disgraceful situation with the noble Mr. Assange is not dissimilar, you know, to Pontius Pilate offering the mob Barabbas over Jesus Christ. And alas, we know what happens to the tellers of truth. Well, it's not dissimilar at all. Uh, the British government are playing the role of Pontius Pilate, washing their hands, uh, trusting that the Americans will uh, treat their prisoner fairly. Uh, how, how empty are promises such as that, given what everyone knows about the American injustice system. Uh, Julian is not Jesus. Nobody is Jesus except Jesus. But Julian is a truth teller. Julian is yes. a person that has gone forth uh, to do good in the world. In that sense, uh, whether he's a follower of Jesus or not, he's doing God's work. Uh, and it's up to all of us to come to his side. Although I read you a quote today, uh, someone said, Jesus fed 5,000, but only 500 followed him uh, after lunch. Uh, Jesus had 12 disciples, but only uh, four of them went into the garden. And when Jesus was on the cross, only one of them stood by his side. The closer to the cross you get, the smaller the crowd. I don't know if the numbers are true, but it's quite a telling point. Anyway, on you go. Yes, uh, more on Assange. Uh, Olu Femi Okiniyi says, if Assange had exposed Russian atrocities and war crimes, he would be loaded in the West now. In that case, had Russia asked yeah. us to extradite him to them, would we have done so? I think not. He is a political detainee persecuted for his work as a journalist and publisher. Um, and just uh, to um, conclude on... Uh, Julian would have had the Nobel Prize. J Julian would be a Nobel Prize laureate if he had been using his journalistic skills to serve the empire instead of to expose the empire. Indeed, doing his work. Uh, Helen Guthels says, I am worried about Julian's health. What exactly does too ill to attend mean? This reminds me of James Connolly, wounded during the Easter Rising and who had to face the firing squad tied to a chair because he could not stand up. Another comparison. Yeah, a very good one. Uh, James Connolly at Kilmainham Jail, shot in a chair. My late grandfather told me that story every time he had a few beers. Uh, it was something that I grew up with. It was a particular yeah. example of the barbarity of empire that they executed a man who had to be brought in to be executed on a stretcher and tied uh, to a structure in order to be executed. So that was the British Empire in 19 and 16. Uh, the empire in 20 and 24 is no different 
uh, empires are like that. That's what empires do. And those who serve empire as uh, auxiliaries, as vassal states, like Britain is now serving the American empire, uh, will be remembered in history uh, in contempt. Last one from you. Last one is uh, on how you started with the House of Commons. George, our MP, Speaker, is a disgrace and puts shame on us in Chorley. When you get stuck into this lot in two weeks' time, I will be cheering you on. A lifetime voter, a Labour voter, until Jeremy Corbyn got booted out. I am so distant from socialist values. An ex minor I want you to take up the baton for us working class people. Joe. I'm ready. Join us in the Workers' Party, the party of the workers. Thank you for that. I do believe that Chorley has been badly let down by the conduct of the speaker today. If he sees this video, I'll find it even more difficult to catch his eye uh, than it would ordinarily be when I return to the House. But I can do no other than to utterly condemn the shameful conduct of the chair and of the so-called Labour so-called opposition today in the House of Commons. They have brought further disgrace upon democracy in Britain. And I hope that a week tomorrow, I'll be able to start doing something directly about that. Thanks, uh, Gayatri, for that. I'll see you later. Maybe go for a bag of chips. It's nearly your birthday. Simon is in Florida. He's our professor on the US and the ceasefire. Simon, welcome. Greetings to you, Mr. Galloway, and to your worldwide audience, though unfortunately I do not bring glad tidings. And um, you're quite right that there has been some definite um, underhandedness in the House of Commons this evening. But you'll be interested to know that Hoyle is currently meeting with the leaders of all the major parties trying to keep his job. So it may not be his eye that you're trying to catch in a few days' time. So that would be interesting to see how that turns out. Yes. It was a note Maybe was they'll notable. make me the speaker, Simon. Well, you, you're already going to be independent, so you wouldn't even have to renounce your party affiliation. So that would save some time, wouldn't it? Exactly. I, I'd be an excellent speaker of the House of Commons, trust me. Anyway, go on. Um, it, it was noticeable, though, that the clerk of the Commons publicly called out the decision of the... Um, he did. Speaker, I'd be, I'd be interested to know what the last precedent for that was. Maybe one of your staff can look that up. It, there may have been a quiet word in the ear in the past, but to actually publicly mm. call him out, I think, was probably highly unusual. But unfortunately, this follows on another despicable scene in the United Nations Security Council yesterday, where obviously, as feared, uh, though also forecast, um, Mrs. Greenfield, the ambassador for the United States, uh, once again, in the face of near universal opposition, the only um, state abstaining being the laptop of, of the United Kingdom, unfortunately. So it ended up being a, a 13 4 an immediate ceasefire as proposed by the Republic of Algeria and the United States, just the lone voice against having delayed the vote even occurring for 20 days, during which time, obviously, yeah. many, many more people were gravely killed and wounded in Gaza. A lot and of dead people, yeah. It's noticeable, I think, the um, the reaction of the Algerian foreign minister <laughs> and of the, the entire two and a half hour proceedings, along with the very good lady from Guyana again, who's the conduct I will shortly explain. Just this one sentence, if I may. And the Algerian ambassador, after expressing his disappointment and dissatisfaction, which was um, echoed later by the Chinese, who also had a bit of an argument with the Israeli ambassador, who seems to be going out of his way to um, find a superpower to have a, a fight with. The Algerian That's ambassador right. said that he would continue to work within the United Nations in order to ensure that the war was brought to a close as swiftly as possible. And then he said this incredibly poignant thing in Arabic with simultaneous translation so people can find it on the UN web um, YouTube channel if they wish. 
he said that he would be powered by the souls of thousands of innocent people. Powered by the souls of thousands of innocent people. And I have to say yeah, that uh, there, there was a moment where everyone could have like Paul. He had already said that at this point in history, everyone would have to look to their conscience when deciding how they would vote. Now, obviously, you and I understand that's rhetoric, and normally the, these ambassadors have kind of written instructions from their governments as to how yeah. they're going yeah. to vote. Yeah. But the, the excuses yeah. from the American ambassador were paper thin, paper thin. Mm-hmm. And it was noticeable that immediately after the Algerian ambassador, the um, ambassador from Guyana, who's still the rotating president of the Security Council, she very succinctly, in um, approximately five minutes, absolutely took apart, phrase by phrase, the American argument that had largely rounded upon the conduct Um, the accusations of misconduct against the Algerians, saying that they had rushed the vote and they hadn't been willing to listen to other people and they hadn't cooperated in terms of uh, having amendments suggested and so forth like that. And she categorically refuted all of those allegations. And it was noticeable that whilst they said they didn't agree with every single word of the Algerian draft, both the French Mm. and the Civilians fellow NATO members uh, roundly criticized the conduct of the United States. But unfortunately, this is not the only bad news that we have been witnessing. Um, it now is crystal clear that the PTI have, in Pakistan and Mr. Mr. Khan have been uh, soundly cheated in upwards of 80 parliamentary seats for the National Assembly, and it now looks almost certain that... Um, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, though even his parliamentary victory is heavily disputed, will be leading the um, government once again, taking over from his brother now that he's returned from his um, sojourn in the United Kingdom whilst he was avoiding prosecution. And um, unfortunately, they'll be allied with... The king of Mayfair. He's He's the king of Mayfair. I need to hurry on, Simon, because of the hour. I want to get in an African call. Ali in Gambia on Palestine. Go ahead, Ali. Walaikum salam. Welcome. Go ahead, Ali. You know what? Before I go, I told you one thing. The time you are was in uh, Press TV. Your hair, on, your, your hair was black, my hair was black. Now we are all uh, white. But you are a very yes, truthful are. in this world. I can assure you this. Thank you. About, uh, about this place, uh, Russia and Ukraine, I start <clears> with that before going to the Middle East. Yeah, be quick, uh, though, because I'm going to cut you off in two minutes. Yeah, okay, uh-huh. You see, uh, Russia and Ukraine. What makes the cost? What makes the cost is just the Americans and the Germans and the British. Look at look at what they did. The Germans are still sending weapons to uh, Ukraine, and look at what they did to their yeah. uh, uh, gas pipeline. Is that correct? Oh, they, destroyed their, their, uh, they destroyed their whole economy. Yeah, yeah. Well, look at them. They are still talking about Russia. They want to go on Russia. Look at that. Is that proper? Huh? And they are selling them gas. Very expensive nowadays. Ali, you've got uh, your television on, your YouTube on, unfortunately, which kind of spoils your call. So I'm going to ask you to call me back on Sunday because I've got some questions to ask you about Gambia and about Africa. And you have made a very good call on Palestine, Russia and Ukraine this evening. I do need to finish bang on at nine o'clock, unfortunately. Uh, So the poll results are 99% on Telegram, say free Julian Assange. 
95% on Twitter, 97% on the YouTube community poll, 97% on the YouTube stream. And 25,858 of you voted. Don't forget to download the Moats podcast from wherever you get your podcasts. Scan the QR code on your screen now to get the full catalogue. Well, I have to go. I've got another urgent appointment, so I need to finish bang on the nine o'clock closing hour now. But I want to simply reflect that this was the day that a pastor from Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus Christ, was refused an audience with Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Imagine that.